I was thinking about uh, this study about the bodily resurrection. I was thinking a way to approach this. There are so many scriptures and so many different ways to approach the subject. But I came up with this acrostic. I, uh, an acrostic, of course, is a device, a rhetorical device where you take a word, like the word resurrection. I hope you can see that. And uh, then you use each letter to, uh, you, to make a phrase or make a point. And so that's what I've done. And I think that once I did this, that just about, it, it just really covers the subject. It just covers about everything that uh, the Bible has to say. Not that this is all the scriptures, but it covers every aspect, hopefully, of the bodily resurrection. I'll tell you what I want. I want a new body. The older I get, the more weary I become of this body. This body has aches and pains. And if you're in this audience and you're a young person and you don't have any aches, you don't have any pains, you will. If you live long enough, you will, and you'll understand. I know there are people here that understand what I mean. Uh, Luther Presley, many, many years ago, wrote that great song that we often sing on the resurrection morning, when all the dead in Christ shall rise, I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Sown in weakness, raised in power, ready to live in paradise. I'll have a new body. Praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Free from every imperfection, youthful, happy, I shall be. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. Glorified with him forever. Death will be lost in victory. I'll have a new body, praise the Lord. I'll have a new life. And so indeed, we sing about that. The scriptures talk about it. And so we're going to talk about the bodily resurrection. Not just the resurrection, but the resurrection of the body. And uh, that's really the focus of what we're going to consider this evening. So I want to go ahead and start and First of all, I've got the word, uh, the letter R, of course, first letter in the word resurrection. And you'll notice that the word, the letter R stands for the reappearing of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus appeared 2,000 years ago. He appeared on this earth as a man. He lived and he died on the cross and he was resurrected and went back to heaven. And the Bible teaches that he is going to reappear before the bodily resurrection before the day of judgment and the end of the world, he is going to reappear. Listen to this passage in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now here Paul is referring to the first appearing of the Lord Jesus. God sent Jesus into this world. He appeared as a man and he brought life and immortality to light. He saved us from our sins by his death on the cross. And so Jesus appeared. But the Bible teaches that he will appear a second time. And uh, I think this is a key scripture. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, a familiar passage to us, the apostle says, It's appointed for men once to die, and after this the judgment. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time without sin or apart from sin for salvation. Now this is a very key passage of scripture. There are so many scriptures that refer to the appearing or the coming or the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to notice some of them uh, here in just a moment. A few more of them. But you know, this is where these AD 70 folks really uh, get things confused and other people as well. If I understand uh, what they teach, they teach that Jesus is not going to reappear. That is, he is not coming back. There's not going to be a day of judgment. There's not going to be a bodily resurrection. Jesus appeared, they say. His reappearance was when he came in destruction on Jerusalem. But here's the problem with that. It is true that there are several figurative or representative appearances, to use uh, Mike's terminology, but there are only two literal appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he would come in his kingdom. That was a figurative or a spiritual coming. He told the apostles in John 
14, he said, I'm going away, but I won't leave you comfortless. I'll send the Holy Spirit. I will come to you. Now, Jesus told the apostles, I will come to you. He didn't come to them literally. He came to them, as Mike just taught us, representatively through the Holy Spirit. Figuratively, spiritually, he came to them. And so there's, and he came, of course, in destruction, in judgment on Jerusalem. But there are only two times when Jesus is spoken of as coming literally. He came the first time literally or bodily when he was born into the world. And the writer says in Hebrews 9, 27, that he will come a second time. Now, a second time implies a first time. There's a first time. There's a second time. The first time was literal and bodily. We know that. And so, therefore, the second coming referred to in this passage and so many others refers to a literal bodily coming. And the Bible, as we said, uh, teaches this. The New Testament teaches this over and over and over again. And let me just uh, refer to some of these passages. And here's where I wish I had a PowerPoint so I could put them up here and you could see the passages. That is one of the benefits of it. But listen to these passages or uh, take note of them or look at them. In Titus 2 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, We're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 and verse 7, Peter talks about the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes. He says, I pray that it may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the word revelation in this passage, I believe in the old King James, it's appearing. I'm quoting here from the new King James translation. But the word revelation or appearing in this passage comes from the Greek word epiphania, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, from which we get our word epiphany. And an epiphany, people talk about, I had an epiphany. An epiphany is simply a, a revelation. Something occurs or appears. And, the, and Peter said, Jesus is going to appear. There's going to be a reappearing of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 14. Paul said, I urge you in the sight of God and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Now, was Paul telling Timothy just to keep the commandment? By the way, in the context, the commandment was fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Keep yourself uh, from a sin. Was he just to keep that commandment until the destruction of Jerusalem? Until Jesus came then? Or until the Lord Jesus comes back? The second time, apart from sin, unto salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, the great chapter about the bodily resurrection, of course, the Apostle Paul says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And so when Jesus comes, when he returns, when he reappears, that's when we're going to be raised from the dead. And that's what he's talking about. And we'll have more to say about that, of course, as we go along. Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, I love this passage, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Jesus is our life. That's the reason so many of us, so many of you have driven all the miles you've driven. Some of you worked today and drove all these miles to be here. So you could be a part of this study. Why? Jesus is your life. This is our life. And he says when he appears, we're going to share his glory. We will share His glory. 1 John 2 verse 28 says, Abide in Him, that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. And these are just a few of the passages. The New Testament is filled with these references about the appearance, or as I'm calling it, the reappearance, the second coming of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes we... Lose focus. I think we have lost focus. Even those of us who love the Lord, He's our life. But we get so busy and so uh, wrapped up in the affairs of this life that we forget about looking for Jesus. He's, he's coming back. And when He comes back, we're going to share in His glory. And we're going to have a new body. And we're going to talk more about that 
as we go along. Well, that leads me to the second letter and the second point I want to make. When Jesus reappears, when Jesus comes back the second time, then that will be the end of time. Now, that's interesting because, you know, millennialists, people who believe in the thousand-year reign and the rapture and all of that, they say when Jesus returns, that's going to be the beginning. Really, it will be the beginning of the kingdom. The kingdom hasn't even been set up, they claim. It will be the beginning of the thousand-year reign. It will be the beginning of Jesus reigning on the throne of David. Some even teach, in their theory, it will be the beginning of the rapture when he comes, or the beginning of the tribulation period. They have different uh, ways of interpreting this theory. But it will be the beginning. They said, but you know, the Bible teaches when Jesus reappears, that will be the end. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24, as Paul is talking about the second coming and the bodily resurrection, he says, Jesus will come back. And he says, then comes the end. Now that's how plain can it be? Then comes the end. And then he goes on to say, for he must reign. Well, I thought he wasn't reigning. I thought Jesus was not going to reign until he comes back. No, he's reigning right now on the throne of David, spiritually. He must reign until all enemies are put under his feet. The last enemy, as we'll see in a little while, is death, which will be destroyed or swallowed up ultimately and forever when Jesus comes. And then he goes on to say, without uh, reading the passage, that he'll deliver the kingdom back. I thought the kingdom hadn't been established yet. Yes, the kingdom has been established. Jesus is reigning over his kingdom, the church in this world. And when he comes back, he'll deliver the kingdom back to God so that God may be all in all, as Paul goes on to say. So it's going to be the end. Now there's an interesting series of statements made by Jesus over in John chapter 6. In fact, I think I'm going to turn over there. I think I've got time to do this. I'm going to turn over and read these. In John chapter 6, Jesus is speaking to the people, the Jews. And I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 39, he says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Notice that. Then in verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day day. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Now, if it is the last day, when Jesus raises the dead, how many days are after the last day? Certainly not a thousand years, not seven years. Not a so-called tribulation period. If it's the last day, that's it. That's the end. The end of time. The end of the world. And of course, Peter taught us over there in 2 Peter 3 that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the earth and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. The elements shall melt with fervent heat seeing that these things shall be dissolved, he says. What persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? That's it. It will be the end of all things as we know them on this earth. That leads us to the next point. When Jesus comes, that will be the end. And the saints will rise first. And of course, this is a great passage we're very familiar with. I won't take time to read it over First Thessalonians chapter 4. Those brethren in Thessalonica were concerned about their loved ones who had died in Christ. What's going to happen to them? We know the passage. Paul says, I want to tell you a mystery. Now, the word mystery here means something that had not been revealed previous to this time. Paul said, here's something that I want to reveal to you by the Holy Spirit. If we're alive and remain, if we're alive when Jesus reappears, when he comes back, we will not precede them that are asleep in Jesus. But the saints, the dead in Christ, will rise first. And then we that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Notice, 
He didn't say we'll rise to meet the Lord in the air, stay up there for seven years, during which the earth will be in a tribulation period, then come back down and reign for a thousand years with Jesus on the earth. No. The earth's going to be dissolved, obliterated. It will be the end of time. He said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. But the saints will rise first. Of course, they will be changed, transformed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and so will we, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But they will rise first. Now that leads me to my next point, which I think is a very important point. And that is the ungodly will also be resurrected. Not only will the saints, now some people, you know, have the idea that when uh, the ungodly die, they just perish forever. Or even if they are raised up, they'll just be uh, uh, annihilated forever. But the Bible teaches the ungodly will be raised as well at the reappearance of Jesus. In John chapter 5 and verse 28, Jesus said, don't marvel at this. Now listen, in the verse just before that, Jesus said, those that hear my voice, he said, I can give them life. I believe the Lord here was talking about spiritual life. As uh, Mike said, when we hear and obey the words of Jesus, the words of the Spirit, we're born again. We have spiritual life. Maybe Jesus, I don't know, perhaps he saw a look of uh, confusion on the faces of the audience. He said, don't marvel at that. I want to tell you something else. The hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Now that has to be a bodily resurrection. That can't be a spiritual resurrection because some are going to be raised to a resurrection of damnation. And the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't condemn, it saves. So he's talking here about a bodily resurrection that will take place when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. In Matthew 25 and verse 32, Jesus told uh, the parable about, he said, when the Son of Man comes and sits in the throne of his glory, before him shall be gathered all nations, and he'll divide them like a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Now we've got the sheep and we've got the goats. The sheep, of course, are the righteous. He says, come, you blessed of my Father. And the goats depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And so we have a resurrection and we have a day of judgment. And, of course, the Bible talks about this over and over again. In Revelation 20, verses 13 through 15, John said that he saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were opened. Another book, the book of life, was opened. And listen. Those whose names were not found in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we've got people who have their names in the Lamb's book of life. That's the righteous. And those who do not have their names in the Lamb's book of life, but they're standing before the throne of God on that great day of judgment. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 22, Jesus spoke a word of condemnation to those people on that occasion, they would not accept him and his uh, authority, accept him as the Messiah. And he said, I want to tell you that in the day of judgment, you know, I've met some people even in the church who don't believe there's going to be a day of judgment. There was one brother that where I was at one time that he wanted to argue with me every night after I was there. I didn't preach on this every night, but every night he wanted to argue that there's not going to be a day of judgment. He said, look, when, when we die then our fate is sealed. Isn't that right? Well, that's right. So why is there going to be a day of judgment if our fate is our, our destiny is already sealed? I said there's going to be a day of judgment because the Bible says there's going to be a day of judgment. And I think we misunderstand what the judgment's going to be. It's not going to be like one of these court cases we see on TV. Judge Judy or one of these other judges who listens to the testimony and then says, let me decide. No, our fate is already decided. It will be when the verdict is passed down and when the final Judgment, the final separation, takes place. But anyway, Jesus said it would be more tolerable for the cities of Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for this generation. In verse 24, he said it will be more tolerable for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we remember how wicked those people were. But he said, you people that hear my voice and don't obey, there's going to be more tolerance for Sodom and Gomorrah than you in the day of judgment of judgment. Jesus sent out the 70. Mike talked about that. He told them in chap Matthew chapter 10 and verse 15, 
If you go into a city and they, and they receive your word, stay there. But if they reject your word, he said, when you leave that city, shake the dust off your feet. And he said, I'm telling you that it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I'm telling you, that's a serious thing. There's going to be a day of judgment. And people get away with things here. People think everything's going to be all right. But there's coming a day of reckoning when everything will be brought into judgment by the Lord. And so the righteous are going to be raised. Saints will rise first. Then if we're alive and remain, we'll be caught up together with them. The ungodly will be raised. And uh, there will be a day of judgment. And the Bible says we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now I want to go on and talk about something that's really wonderful. And that is there's going to be a reunion with the saints. And right here I want to talk about the idea, and this might be a part of the question this evening, I don't know, will we recognize each other? Now Paul said the saints will rise first. If we're alive, we'll be caught up together with him and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But are we going to recognize each other? Will we know each other in heaven? Well, first of all, after Paul talks about the fact that we'll be caught up together with them. He says, comfort one another with these words. Now, the comfort, as I understand it, would be in knowing that we're, we're going to be reunited with our loved ones and other brethren in Christ who've gone on. We'll be, we're going to see them again and be with them forever. And there's comfort in that. Now, if we're not going to know them, if we're all going to be together, but I won't know you and you won't know me, there's not much comfort in that. You might say, well, you're going to be there, but I'm not going to know you. You're not going to know me. I might even not know myself. I believe we will be essentially the same personalities we are now. Listen to this. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19, Paul said, for what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Let me say something right here first with reference to the A.D. 70 theory. If he's talking there about the destruction of Jerusalem, is he saying to these brethren in Thessalonica, here's what I'm hoping for. Here's my joy, that when Jerusalem's destroyed, I see you in the presence of Christ. Does that make any sense to anybody on the top side of God's earth? He's talking about when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. The same thing he's talking about in chapter 4, a couple of chapters later on. But here's the point, really. Paul obviously believed that he was going to recognize these brethren. He said, this is going to be my joy, my hope, my crown of rejoicing is to see you right there in the presence of Jesus. He obviously believed he would know them. Here's another one. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. Paul said, increase and abound in love to one another so that he may establish your hearts in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're looking forward to seeing Jesus, first of all, of course. But we're looking forward to seeing him with all the saints. It's going to be a great reunion day when we're all reunited together. Now, what are we going to look like? Well, we're going to get to that here in just a little bit. If we're going to recognize each other, what are we going to recognize? That, of course, is the... Million dollar question. And we'll get to that in just a moment. We probably won't answer it, but we'll get to it in just a moment. The next two go together. I want to take the next R and the next E together as I move on. There is a reserved home eternal in the heavens. The Lord Jesus has gone to make reservations for us. And we know this great scripture in John 14. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Lord has gone to heaven, our forerunner, we're told in Hebrews 6, and he's making reservations for us. We have a room. We have, as the old uh, King James says, we have a mansion. He's preparing rooms and mansions for us in heaven, a place, a reserved home we have in heaven. Now, i got about 18 minutes, and so I'm doing pretty good, I think. I can speed up if I need to. But I want to read a little bit over 2 Corinthians. I'll tell you what, I believe personally that Paul is at his most eloquent and his most sublime in 2 Corinthians. I think 2 Corinthians is kind of an overlooked book 
But I, I believe Paul soars to eloquence unparalleled in this great uh, letter. And I want to read just a little bit. I want to start. These are some of my favorite scriptures in all of the Word of God. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul says, Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. Isn't that great? We know, we believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And therefore we know he's going to raise us up with you. We're all going to be raised up together to be with the Lord. And then uh, down in verse uh, 16 he says, do not, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And I'll go on and kind of paraphrase the rest of it. Paul says we groan, don't we? When we're sick, when our loved ones are sick, at funerals, we groan down deep in our souls for a body that's not subject to what this body is subject to. Paul says it's not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. It's not that we want to die. It's not natural to want to die. But sometimes in times of great distress and agony, we want that body. And we know that we have a body reserved for us in heaven. We have something reserved for us eternal in the heavens. Let's talk about that body. The Bible says this corruptible is going to be swallowed up. You know, when I was doing this study, I guess I'd seen that word. I know I'd read this passage over and over, but I never really had noticed or focused on that word swallowed. He says this corruptible will be swallowed up. And he quotes from a passage over in Isaiah chapter 25. Isn't that what it is? In Isaiah chapter 25, which I won't take the time to read, but it's a great messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about uh, Mount Zion, which is a representation of the kingdom and how the Messiah would come. And he would, there would be a great feast and the veil which was over hearts and eyes would be taken away when Jesus came. And then tears would be wiped away from every face. John quotes that in Revelations. And death will be swallowed up, totally swallowed up. You know what I thought about? I thought about when Moses went in to Pharaoh's court and cast down that rod and it became a serpent. And Pharaoh called in his magicians and they cast their rods down and they became ser uh, serpents. But you know, Moses' serpent swallowed theirs up and Moses took the serpent by the hand and the snakes were gone. One of these days, death is going to be gone. Now, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he swallowed up death in his life. He was the first fruits. He conquered death. And his death is an anticipation. It is a foreshadowing of our death and our resurrection. Now death still reigns. Jesus conquered death in his resurrection. But death still reigns. What are we all afraid of tonight? Death. That's the great enemy. But when Jesus comes back, death will be completely swallowed up and death will come to an end when the Lord Jesus comes back. When that happens, T, there's going to be a transformation that is going to take place. And now we're getting down to the body and what's going to happen to the body. What a great scripture this is in Philippians 3 and verse 21. Paul said our citizenship is in heaven. Oh yes, there's a sense in which I'm a citizen of the state of Texas, and you're citizens of Missouri or Oklahoma. We're all citizens of the United States. But really our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, I think the old King James says, change, change or transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the power by which he's able to subdue all things unto himself. 
And so this body, this lowly body, and he means by that a body that's subject to decay, to death, to pain. He's going to change it, transform it, and we'll have a body, a glorified, glorious body like the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, over in Job chapter 14, of course, Job was suffering so greatly. Satan had taken away all of his children. He had boils all over his body. And one of the beautiful passages is in Job 14, verse 1, where Job says, Man, this born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He flees as a shadow and continues not. Isn't it the truth? We come forth, we bloom, hopefully we bloom for a little while, and then we diminish physically and mentally. And then we're gone from this world. And so Job pondered that, and in verse 14 he says, he says, uh, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service. Kind of interesting the way he puts that. All the days of my hard service will I wait till my change comes. Now, I'm not sure what all Job understood about this, but Job believed a change was coming, a transformation was coming. And I want to tell you this evening, brothers and sisters in Christ and friends, a change is coming. A transformation is going to take place. And these bodies that are subject to so much disease and pain and sorrow are going to be transformed like the glorious body of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say this just real quickly. Every time I think about this passage where Paul says here we eagerly wait. We're eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the transformation of our body. I think when I was uh, teaching school, there was a Hispanic lady uh, named Rebecca Martinez who... Uh, ran one of our math labs, and she was a very religious lady. She uh, was a Pentecostal lady. She believed she could speak in tongues, and she believed uh, in the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. But she was a nice woman, and we, she knew I was a preacher and a member of the Lord's Church, and we talked from time to time. Anyway, one day I took my kids down there to the lab, and she said, it was on a Thursday, she said, Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Dickinson, she was so excited. I need to tell you what happened last night at our church. I said, well, what happened? She said, well, we all got to praying in the Spirit. And, of course, they were praying in the Spirit, and everybody was talking at once, like they do, you know, the men and women too. We were all praying, and we all got excited, and we all got to praying for Jesus to come. Everybody was saying, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come right now. Come tonight, Lord Jesus. We were all praying. She said, all of a sudden, there was kind of a lull. A moment, just a moment of silence. And in that moment of silence, there was a fellow back there who spoke out and said, Lord, don't come. Don't listen to them. I'm not ready. I got some things I need to change. Don't listen to them. Don't come. And she said, we all lost it. We just all started laughing. We couldn't help it. It was hilarious. And of course, I thought it was too. But you know what I thought later? I thought, uh, which side would we have been on? If somebody were to pray in this building tonight, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We're eagerly awaiting your coming. It would be all right if you came tonight. Could you say amen? Would we say, or would we say well, I want the Lord to come, but uh, I'm not ready. Well, you know what? As we mature and grow older and more spiritual, hopefully, we should more and more be eagerly anticipating the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what's going to take place when he comes. And then I want to go to... Uh, the next one, which is, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am. Well, let me, I need to talk about 1 Corinthians 15 over here a little bit. Really, I could spend the whole time talking about that. But I need to talk about that, that the transformation a little bit. The Apostle Paul got some questions from the church at Corinth. And they said, if there's going to be a resurrection, what kind of a body are we going to have? That's the question. You know, if a little baby, and here's what comes up sometimes. If a little baby dies... When that little baby is resurrected, will it still be a little baby? If an old person dies, someone who wastes away with cancer, gets down to 85 pounds, is that what they're going to look like? Well, of course, we don't know. And we're going to say more about that in just a minute. The apostles didn't even have all the answers to that. But here, here's the way Paul answered that. Paul said, you foolish person. He said, you're not thinking correctly. He said, if you take a seed, you take a watermelon seed and plant it in the ground, you don't expect that seed to come up. You expect a watermelon to come up. The plant that comes up differs in glory 
from the seed. He said there's different kinds of bodies on the earth, terrestrial and celestial. The stars differ in glory. So it is in the resurrection. This body is sown in weakness, is raised in power. It's sown in dishonor, is raised in glory. It's sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. And then he goes on to talk about how this mortal will put on immortality. And this corruptible will put on incorruption. And then will be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so a transformation is going to take place. And uh, we'll try to say a little more about that at the very end. But I am, Jesus said, the resurrection and the life. Remember in John chapter 11, Lazarus died. Jesus arrives on the scene. Martha meets him and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus said, your brother shall live again. Listen. She says, yes, Lord, I know that he shall rise again at the resurrection of the last day. There's that word again. Martha believed there was going to be a resurrection at the last day. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus did not correct her. What Jesus told her was, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha said, yes, Lord. A little later, you remember, at the tomb, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit here, Jesus said, roll the stone away. And Martha, practical Martha, said, Lord, he's, he's been dead four days. It's going to be a stench like you've never smelled coming from that tomb. Jesus said, Martha, didn't I tell you, if you would believe you would see the power of God. Don't you believe that I am the resurrection? She said, roll the stone away. And of course, he brought Lazarus back from the dead. Here's an interesting passage that I want to just get in real quickly. In Matthew 22 and uh, verse 30, I can't see it over there, the way it's folded out, but you can see it, I hope. Matthew chapter uh, 22 and verse 32. Actually, verses 23 through verse 32. You remember the Sadducees, of course, did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection, among other things. And they had come up with this argument that they thought was pretty good. In fact, it was pretty good. They came to Jesus and they said, now listen, we don't believe in a bodily resurrection. And here's one reason. There was a woman who was married to a man. The man died. So she married another man. He died. She married another man. He died. And finally, she'd been married to seven men. And they all died, and then she died. Now, here was a woman who had seven husbands. Who's going to be her husband in the resurrection? That's a pretty good argument. I mean, she's going to be married to all seven men? Jesus said, you, you do err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. In the resurrection, they're not married or given in marriage, but they're like the angels in heaven. But here's the point I want to make. He said, uh, I want to ask you something now. As concerning the resurrection... Have you considered this scripture? The Lord said, God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, when God made that statement, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those patriarchs had been dead for a long time. But God said, I am their God. And then he concluded by saying, God's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Listen, when we die, our body dies. It's placed in the tomb. But we're alive. D.L. Moody was a famous preacher for many years ago, and I'm going to appropriate something he used to like to say, if, I'm, if I may do that. Listen, one of these days, if you outlive me, and I hope you do, if we die before the Lord comes, if you outlive me, you're going to hear one of these days that Jerry Dickinson's dead. You are. That's just the way it is. You're going to hear, probably on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere, Jerry Dickinson's dead. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. I'll be, I'm, I'll be alive. Now, my body will be dead. Somebody will have to preach my funeral. I'll be buried, but I will be alive. God is not the God of the dead, Jesus said. He's the God of the living. And our spirits will be alive to await the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that an awesome idea? Those are the words of our Lord. And then quickly, only believe. That's what he told Martha. Only believe. That's what he told Jairus over there in Mark chapter 5. Remember when he got to the home of Jairus, his 12-year-old daughter had died, and everybody was crying, and, and Jesus said, she's not dead, she's asleep. 
Now, you know, I've preached to the funerals of children before and other people before, of course, and it would be absurd for me to stand before a coffin and say, this person's not dead. They're just asleep. But Jesus said it. Jesus could see her spirit. She was alive. And he called her back from the dead. He told Jairus, only believe. Only believe. Don't give up hope. Only believe. And uh, you'll see the power of God. And then finally, not seeing, but believing. And this ought to mean a great, great deal to us. Here's a great passage. 1 Peter 1 and verse 8 says, Now listen, Peter had seen the Lord. He'd been with the Lord. He was one of his uh, disciples. But these people to whom Peter wrote had not seen the Lord like you and me. We've not seen him, literally. But listen to what Peter says to them. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believe him. You rejoice with joy inexpressible, or as the old King James says, unspeakable and full of glory. I haven't seen Jesus, and you haven't either. Not literally, but we believe. We believe. We haven't seen, but we believe. And uh, that's what faith is, the belief in testimony. And we believe he's coming back, and we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I'll finish with this scripture, of course, and this is a good one to finish with. First John chapter 3. Now, the question is, Jerry, we're going to recognize each other. You believe? We uh, are going to be aware of each other. What am, I want to know what I'm going to look like. Well, that's what the Corinthians want to know. What am I going to look like? What? Well, I don't know. But listen, don't be too disappointed in me. The Apostle John didn't know. And obviously the Apostle Paul didn't know. Now, Paul talked about different bodies and different uh, glories and all that. But he didn't tell them exactly what you'll look like. And John obviously didn't know. In fact, he says he didn't. In 1 John chapter 3, and verse 1, John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. But it does not appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we'll be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And he that has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. The reason we purify ourselves and we buffet our bodies and we live for the Lord is he's coming back. And I don't know exactly what we're going to be like. John didn't know either. But we're going to be like him. And we're going to see him as he is when he comes back. And what a glorious hope we 